Yo, what is up? You have found I Like the Blazers. I am your host, Brandon Goldner, and I am stoked to share that today's guest is Michael Weisenberg of Rookie Wire. We talk about a bunch of stuff, including him growing up in Toronto and being a Blazers fan, the old Brandon Roy, LaMarcus Aldridge, Greg Oden teams, and then trends from around the NBA just a couple of games in, whether the NBA is more interesting now that there's more parity at the top about the Warriors dynasty, whether they're going to want to reload and maybe trade Draymond Green the Western Conference, the top rookies so far, again, early sample size, and then the Blazers' defense and whether the culture set by Coach Stotts and Dame can carry through this this period of uncertainty and melding together all these new players. But before we get to that, I do want to talk a little bit about the game yesterday. The interview with Michael was recorded on Monday, October 28, but today is Tuesday, October 29. The Blazers lost to the San Antonio Spurs 110-113. to Damian Lillard had a couple of shots at the end that would have tied the game, including one that was absolutely heartbreakingly 99% in the basket, popped in and out from the left corner as you're looking, well, from the right corner as you're looking at the basket. And there was like, what, like 1.3 seconds left to inbound the ball and, and they get it to him in the corner and he gets the shot up and it looks like it's going in and Terry Stotts is leaning over. The whole bench is ready to explode. There's a fan in the audience. He has his arms pumped up, ready just to go nuts and it doesn't go down, but it was super, super close. An interesting game for a number of reasons and I want to talk about a couple trends that I saw before we get to the interview with Michael. And the first, it's just interesting that the Blazers, they, in this game against the Spurs in San Antonio, and remember, this is the second night of a back-to-back where they don't have Zach Collins, and they're also playing without Yusuf Nurkic, obviously, so they're down a couple of important players. But the Blazers led by 19, six minutes into the game. So they had nearly a 20-point lead almost immediately. And then as quickly as that came, they trailed uh, as the game went on. They trailed by, well, not as quickly as it came. Let me rephrase that. This That's what, when you're trying to say a turn of phrase and it doesn't apply to the situation, you just embarrass yourself. That's what I just did right there. But they led by 19 six minutes into the game. They trailed by 19 with six minutes left in the game. Damian Lillard had not been playing all that well up until that point. And I had to watch the entirety of the fourth quarter all over again just to see what the hell happened. Because again, Blazers down 19 with six minutes left. You think pack it up and go home. That's pretty much it. But then Damian Lillard scored 18 points in the last four minutes. It was pretty impressive. It was all replicable Damian Lillard stuff. Maybe not replicable for everybody, but he was beating people on drives. He was hitting threes. He was getting fouled. He absolutely took over the game, and it was super, super fun to watch. And the fact that he got two shots at the end, both of them would have tied the game, and that last shot with about a second left, I mean, it was like, it. it yes, it, it hit the side of the rim as he was looking at it, what would be the front of the rim if you were looking straight at the basket. But then it it sort of spun toward the backboard and down and looked like it was going in. I mean, it looked like the rotation of the ball was pulling it into the hoop and it just didn't go down. And it was pretty funny when you look at the video of Damian Lillard right after that shot, didn't go in. He was smirking. He was smiling. He knew that it was 99% in and then popped out. So that's the first thing. Blazers led by 19, six minutes in. Trail by 19 with six minutes left. That That is some synchronicity or some symmetry that you don't often see in basketball. So that was, that was interesting. Uh, another thing that jumped out to me, Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum both took 50 shots. Damian Lillard with 28 points, CJ McCollum with 27. Another strong showing from CJ, even though he shot under 50%. Damian Lillard making up most of that ground in that fourth quarter, in which, again, he scored 18 points in the like, last four minutes of the game. But Lillard and McCollum combining for 50. The rest of the team combining for 50 so the Blazers took 100 shots. Damon CJ took 50 of those. That can't be how they get their offense, even though I know, again, they're missing Zach Collins. They've got to see more from other players. People have to contribute more than that. Rodney Hood is three for seven. Mario Hazonia, two for seven. Anthony Simons, five for nine, which is respectable in his 21 minutes. Kent Bazemore was unfortunately one for nine. While his frenetic energy looks good, and I'm all for 
people contributing on the court outside of the box score. When you watch the game, it was obvious he was having some positive impact. When you look at his negative 20 plus minus, which was by far the team worst, when you look at the fact that he was one for nine, those are nine shots that could have come from somewhere else that maybe should have gone down. And, you know, I, there's a lot of, I think, leniency for players like Kent Bazemore in Portland because he does play with passion. He plays with a lot of energy. You can see the care on his face. You can tell that he is giving his full faith and effort, and that resonates with me as a fan. I think it resonates with a lot of people as fans, but it doesn't always mean that someone's contributing. So in his 24 minutes, he, he was, he was pretty woeful. So that's the second thing, 50 shots of the Blazers, 100 coming from Dame and CJ. And they've got to figure out how to spread it out a little bit more than that. And, and one more thing to be fair, like Dame and CJ are going to get theirs and it's not the worst thing in the world that they combine for 50 shots. That's not the most horrible thing. It's just that they, they need to, find production elsewhere. I haven't seen enough. I haven't watched enough games. It's only been four games. The Blazers are two and two for me to have an opinion about where that needs to come from yet. Uh, Don't worry. I will have an opinion about it as I do with everything Blazers related, whether it's well-informed or not, unfortunately. Um, But as of right now, I'm reserving judgment. I need to see more before I can say, okay, this is where it really needs to come from. That's the second thing. The third thing is Damian Lillard. uh, He has three dunks. In this 2019-20 season, in four games, uh, including a really nice dunk near the end of the game during that 18-point in four minutes outburst that pulled the Blazers back to almost sending the game into overtime. But Dame, with three dunks in four games, again, small sample size theater, but if he continues on that pace for 82 games, he'll have 61 dunks. The highest he's ever had in one season is 30, and that's back in 2013-14. So again, I know, caveat, caveat, small sample size, small sample size. I'm not saying that Damian Lillard is going to be dunking 60 times this season. What I'm saying is, at least early, he obviously physically feels really, really good. Uh, Dunks are an indication, especially for smaller players, of how okay they're doing physically, of how, like, if someone is known for dunking and later in their career, they, they, the dunking slows down as it will at some point for Dame that tells you their athleticism is waning a little bit, but for Damian Lillard again, uh, you know, very much a veteran at this point, uh, to be dunking this often, I think is a good sign. And also beyond just the dunking, I'm not saying that that stat means a whole lot in and of itself. What I am saying is that it's indicative of when you watch him, he looks fresh. He looks good to go. He looks ready for the season. Um, players talk about how they carry nagging injuries as the season goes on. It's just good to me to see the Blazers best player coming into the season, looking about as healthy as he can look. So that's, that's good news. So that's the third thing. There's one more thing I wanted to talk about, and then we're going to get to Michael and that's Scala BCA. When I rewatched that fourth quarter, some of those, I almost said many, but some of those fourth quarter minutes had Scala BCA in there. And when you look at his line, it doesn't jump out. He played 13 minutes. He was four for five. He had six rebounds and 10 points uh, and was a negative six in that time. But when you watch him play, he looks capable which that's super important given that Zach Collins is out. And as of today, again, as of Tuesday, the 29th, we know that Zach Collins will be out next game, but we don't yet have a timetable for his return from that dislocated shoulder. But Scal looked competent. He looked aware. He looked nimble. He had a number of putbacks. He had a number of times when he was just around the rim at the right time and just sort of where he needed to be given the situation. And for the Blazers, that's really, really important when you don't have Yusuf Nurkic, when you don't have Zach Collins, when Anthony Tolliver looks like a husk of him, his former self. Although to his credit, he was a plus eight, which was a team best uh, plus eight in his 29 minutes with 10 boards. So maybe coach Stotts knows something that we don't, even though he went one for four for the field did Anthony Tolliver. But given that you have such a dearth of center minutes right now, Scal looking competent, looking aware, looking nimble, looking like he's in the right place at the right time. That is extremely valuable for the Blazers because outside of Whiteside and Scal, 
Who are you looking for for your center minutes? Are you going to be looking at Mario Hazonia again during that Dallas game when they didn't have anyone else to play center and suddenly Mario Hazonia is trying to guard Kristaps Porzingis? You don't want to see a whole lot of that. So the more that Scal can get minutes and look competent in those minutes, the better as far as I'm concerned. And by the way, here's something about those six rebounds. Every last one of them was an offensive board. So what I don't see, what I would like to see, by the way, Six offensive rebounds in a game is a lot. Um, the fact that he got zero defensive rebounds means uh, that I, that he's probably creating space for his teammates to get some of those rebounds. I was about to say, I wish I could see the stats that show, you know, a shot goes up and is the player boxing out or are they in the vicinity of the rebound or, or did they make space for their teammate to come in and grab the board? Because I would be interested to know if he's creating rebounds for other people and those six offensive rebounds are really, I mean, those are extra possessions. Every last one of those is an extra possession. And in a game where possessions are everything, that is extremely important. So they, I'm just, I'm saying like, you know, put, Put a couple of chips of your stock into Scala BCA company or what do they call it? You know, Ben Golliver and Andrew Sharp, who I miss on open floor, talking a lot about Giannis Inc. So Scal Inc., uh, put some money into Scal Inc. stocks because I think the Blazers, A, they're going to need him and B, he, he looks pretty good. And if he's given the opportunity, I hope that that continues moving into the season. So uh, with that, one more little word on the Blazers. They are two and two in this very difficult Western conference. They stand kind of in the middle of the Northwest division where again, no team has played more than four games. So there's not really all that much you can say about it. And I get that, but their next game is going to be at Oklahoma city tomorrow, Wednesday, October 30th. They're going to be playing Chris Paul and Shea Gildas, Alexander and Steven Adams and some other people. Uh, <laughs> so I know it's a road trip. I know that they've already won two games on this four game road trip. I know that going 50% on a road trip is good. And that maybe the Blazers are like, look, you know, we got our two wins. It, it is what it is. But I would like to see the Blazers win this game against Oklahoma city. I know there's a whole lot of people talking about betting lines and gambling is becoming legal. And it's, the thing that you need to know about if you're talking about the NBA and I promise I will get better with my betting and gambling lingo and I'll kind of weave it in as time goes on. I'm never going to be one of those people who's like super into that just because it's not my bag. But if I were a betting person, here's my tipping my stepping my toe into the water of gambling and betting and stuff like that. If I were a betting person, I would bet for the Blazers to win this game. I hope that they do. And uh, that would be great. Blazers would come back from that road trip uh, three and one on the trip three and two overall, if they do win that game, but, but time will tell us and that right now they're two and two, uh, and excited to see where the season takes them from here. Feel like I'm starting to get to know this team a little better. Feel like I'm starting to be able to kind of do the snap, the snap association from the player on the screen to who it actually is. You're not feeling you get when you're last year watching Evan Turner and Aminu and Harkless and Myers Leonard, and you just see them, you know who these people are. Now it's like, kind of have to think about it. Whose number is that? It's Baysmore. It's someone else. So I'm starting to get that kind of muscle memory watching the team, which is a lot of fun. That means they're starting to grow on me as a fan. That's what you want to feel. Uh, you want to care about your team. So with all of that, Again, super stoked to have Michael Weisenberg of Rookie Wire as my guest. And here's our conversation coming right now. Mr. Weisenberg, I presume. Yes, Mr. Goldner. Thank you for having me on. How, how is that in your ranking of like awkward openings on a scale of one to ten? Uh, I wouldn't even give it that much of one. I'd, I'd say maybe it's a four. I need to do better next time. I'm trying to make yeah. my, my guests as uncomfortable as humanly possible. Um, thanks for taking try the time. Try harder, Brandon. Yeah, I, do, I know. I, <laughs> I need to try harder in all things, including with making people feel like uncomfortable. Uh, I wanted to start because, I mean, you've been on podcasts I've hosted before, used to host the Trailcasters. I don't know if I've ever asked you, why are you interested in basketball? Why? What? I mean, you work for Rookie Wire. Why are you interested in basketball in the first place? I would have to say... It probably a large part of it started in Portland. And um, I had grandparents that lived in Portland. I lived in Toronto. And every time I would come out to visit them in Portland, which we would do at least like a month out of every year, I would 
constantly see sports on the television. And like when I was a little kid, I wasn't too into it. But I think about the time I got to be like eight or nine, uh, I just latched onto basketball. And my my grandparents like took me to like a Blazer game. And something that really like captivated me also was um, the 92 Dream Team. Like uh, my grandparents got to see the exhibition when they came to Portland uh, the year before. Nice. And uh, I had a little Michael Jordan jersey. My brother had a little Magic Johnson USA jersey. And yeah, that, that was a, a huge part of it as well. Um, I got to, my parents took me to see Michael Jordan play um, when I was in the third grade, I believe. And he was, uh, it was an exhibition game they had in Toronto where they played Cleveland. And that was really cool. And um, Shaquille O'Neal was like another huge part of my early basketball memories as well. Dude, me too. And uh, like just got very into it. Yeah. But so I had, an, then, I had an aunt that lived in Orlando yeah. and she like went to a game and sent me a picture of him on the early 90s Jumbotron. I was like, look, Brandon, I got to see Shaquille O'Neal in person. I was like, holy shit. That's so cool. Thanks, yeah. Auntie Joanne. I, got, I appreciate you. <laughs> I got to see uh, Shaq when he played against the Raptors with Orlando. I got to see him with the Lakers. So, so wait a minute. I, I'm I, not I sure think, about later on, but yeah. You lived in Toronto, but your grandparents were in Portland. So when when yeah. Toronto got a team, were you a Raptors fan or were you a Blazers fan or what? What was your fandom? So it actually took me a long time to become a Blazers fan. Uh, I didn't become a Blazers fan really until. Um, I started living in Portland myself shortly after college. And a huge part of that was um, just seeing how bright the future of the team was at that time, at least, you know, on paper uh, when they had Brandon Roy, LaMarcus Aldridge and Greg Oden. Oh yeah. And Rudy Fernandez and, you know, ladies love cool Rudy. You were chalking and, up like uh, multiple yeah. finals appearances at least. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it looked like it. it yeah, that's, that's how it felt yeah. to me too. If, oh, if, man. if they would have stayed healthy, man, like every time we talk about like health hypotheticals, that is a huge one. So, so it's really not- quick, I, I'm good. I, I don't want to go too far in nostalgia, but I have to ask, I mean, the team that they have now is super fun to watch. We all love Dame. He's really, really good. I do. You think that the ceiling of this Blazers core is any higher than it was when we thought that Brandon Roy and LaMarcus Aldridge and Greg Oden would all be healthy. Do you think this current team has a higher ceiling than that previous team when they were all healthy? This is a trap question. This is a complete bullshit question. I know. I know. Cause we know well, what the answer is. Yeah. Like, I mean, in, in the thing is we've seen what this team can actually do. Yes. And that has gotten us thus far. And the other team, it was so much based on potential. The other team and, never made you know, out of the first it, it, round. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, like, the other team, based on potential, you were way more excited about the other team. Based on what has actually happened, like, this team is, to me, it's it's such a fun team. And, like, that's a huge part. I, I know I, whenever I would come on your guys' podcast, I would talk about, like, how, you know, they'd eventually have to move on from – Gamer CJ, usually CJ, but, um, it, it's so much fun to watch them and they're, they're still going to be a fun team this year. And, uh, yeah, they, they have some, some great pieces. So it, like the fact that they made the Western conference finals last year, plus, you know, just some of the matchups, uh, they had in the playoffs, like last year was an epic season for the Portland trailblazers. It was so much and, fun. Uh, oh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. The playoffs were amazing. Um, the game I went to where I saw you guys, like that was, oh my God, (laughs) (laughs) four overtime classic. That was so uh, exhausting, but like in the best possible way, it it was incredible. It's, and, And, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I I find, I find, and maybe, I don't know if it's just I'm older or whatever, like my fandom has evolved. I find that this team is the easiest for me to root for. Like Damian Lillard is so easy for me to root for. So easy for me to get behind. Like, I feel like I never really got to know Brandon Roy, like as a personality, he wasn't really that type of dude. Um, And LaMarcus Aldridge the same way. And like, I was maybe too young for Clyde and like social media didn't exist back then. And like, I don't know. It's just like, so for whatever, for whatever, what, 
may happen for whatever happens from now on. Uh, it's a great team, but let's pivot to what is actually happening now in the NBA. Uh, we're recording on Tuesday, October 28th. I think that the most games any team has played at the conclusion of today will be just four games. So it's super early. Uh, so we need to get some super hot takes in way too early reactions from what you've seen around the NBA. Uh, what kind of trends or aberrations or weird things or interesting things from just around the league are catching your eye the most so early in the season so far? I, I would think the way that Minnesota's played so far has been really interesting. And that wasn't something I expected. And with Carl Anthony Towns being, you know, one of the top 10, 15 players in the league, uh, he's been fantastic. And uh, they look like a team. Um, the Phoenix Suns, that's been another, you know, I, I, yeah. I feel like they at least had uh, a few role players to put around Devin Booker now. So, you know, and you know, with Rubio, they, they had a bit of an improvement there at uh point guard or a massive improvement, um, over not really having anybody other than Devin Booker handle the ball consistently. Um, and even with, uh, Deandre Aiden going down, like bringing in Aaron Baines is that, you know, nice, you know, safety blanket. Um, so, yeah, and then uh, some of the improvements of second-year guys, just like, you know, you knew Wendell Carter Jr. is obviously was a guy who was bound to have a huge second season. But um, just even, like, Trey Young and Luka becoming, like, kind of taking that next step where you can see them both being all-stars. And then uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. has been fantastic as well. Um, yeah, the only thing that I'm really missing right now is uh, – we, we all wanted to see Zion Williamson, of course. And, uh, yeah, I can't wait for that to happen. But, um, yeah, and even some of the rookies have been very interesting. Like uh, yesterday, that um, matchup with uh, Brooklyn and uh, Memphis, John Morant had a, a great game. And Kyrie Irving is, like, is a threat to lead the NBA in scoring this year. He was fantastic as well, but John Morant had some huge plays at the end of that game. He tied it up to send it into overtime. He had the assist to Crowder, uh, kind of reminiscing, uh, of that North Carolina, um, Villanova game where Chris Jenkins hit the huge shot. Um, so yeah, it was, um, it, it's a really fun season and it's really wide open. So, uh, yeah, just, very early takes, of course. And I, I like how some people are already, I, I had somebody in one of my group chats, uh, saying that they wouldn't be surprised if Trey young had a better, uh, season than Stephen Curry, which I found to wow. be a remarkably hot take, but, um, that's Trae Young has had a fantastic start and, uh, and Steph Curry has not been particularly good. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Warriors are struggling, but he's still Stephen Curry. He's like, I don't, I don't understand how you can uh, take two games, albeit two fantastic games, and a quarter of play uh, against Philadelphia, and uh, kind of forget what has happened over the last five years. But um, yeah, we'll see. And the, and ultimately, that is what. Uh, being an all-star comes down to is just having that consistency and uh, we'll see if they can keep it up. But so far, Trey Young has looked fantastic in uh, the early play for Atlanta. Well, I want to go back to something you just said, which is the NBA feels like it's more wide open now, which I totally agree with. And yeah. especially at the top, there just seems to be more parity. There seem to be a clump of teams who can legitimately say that we are title contenders where in the years past, it's been like one or maybe two teams I wanted to ask that that reality is that more interesting for you as an analyst and, or you as a fan of the game, is it more interesting when you have that competition at the top? Like, is it more compelling for you? Uh, I'm not talking about the casual fan who might enjoy yeah. the super teams and all that bullshit, but just for you as someone who's deep into the game, is it more interesting to know that there are more potential storylines or would you rather have that more consistent narrative and something you're more familiar with? I, I kind of like having, uh, you know, it be more wide open um, with the Warriors being as dominant as they were. It, it it was always you always had something to talk about with them because, you know, it was like, oh, who can beat the Warriors? And kind of like it, it was just kind of slated against that one team. And then you had four seasons of LeBron trying to beat the Warriors and everything there. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like maybe I was a little more excited for this season, even though last season ended in a way that like, I don't think too many people predicted the Warriors losing the championship last year. Um, and the Raptors just had a fantastically constructed team and the Kawhi trade was completely worth it just based off of winning that championship. Um, and, uh, yeah, even with like them being gone and everything like that, like I, I, I still think they, they really did something really special. So that, that, that was, and plus they, they eventually like DeMar would have been a huge, uh, player on their, on their cap as well. So yeah, like that ended up working out, but, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited about this season. And, uh, I think there are like at least, you know, three or so teams in each conference that, uh, have a chance to be the, the favorite come, uh, April. And I wanted to ask you something related to that. And pardon me if this sounds a little nebulous um, or weird, but let me let me try to get this question out. With the NBA, it had some super teams, and now there's like this enormous amount of parity. And instead of like three superstar teams, you have like a lot of like two superstar teams. I'm wondering if maybe part of that clumping together of players is because players are getting more and more power proportionate to the league and proportionate to owners than they've seen in years past. Like we, we say player empowerment movement. Um, and we're talking about a larger share of the revenue. We're talking about players can control their own communications narrative through social media. So they need traditional media less. They need that platform of the big markets less. And so players have more and more power in the league. I'm wondering if because of that, is there this like super team stasis that the NBA's kind of natural balancing point wants to tip back into super teams, wants to tip back into players bunching up and all kind of like trying to join together? Or do you think that that was just like an aberration and just sort of circumstance and happen chance and like the Warriors got lucky with the cap spike and Steph Curry's contract and all that kind of stuff? Like, do you think that what I'm trying to ask is, do you think that there's some natural pull for the NBA to have like just a handful of like really, really good teams? Yeah, I feel like that's kind of been like in league history. Like other than if you you look by decade, usually – there have just been a few teams who have kind of been like those championship run teams. True. And um, yeah, like it, the seventies was probably where you had like the most parody as far as, you know, you had a few teams that were like fantastic at the beginning of the decade. And then towards the end of the decade, when the Blazers won one, like you, you had a, a few other teams in there. Um, and I don't know if that was the most exciting decade. Like, you know, Sonic snuck one in there. Yeah, exactly. Sonic, you got the bullets. Like it, it, it was, it was an interesting decade of basketball, but I, I don't know if it was as ex- exciting as the eighties when you had the Lakers and Celtics dominate that. Yeah. History, um, history really 90s, smiles yeah. on those dynasties. Oh, for sure. And, and yes, like much of that was built through the draft, but it, it's kind of always been like the player that wants to go to that big market team or, or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, like I, I don't feel like it's that much off of history. Just the way that it's happening is maybe a little bit different. Um, but like you see in Milwaukee right now, like they built themselves a fantastic team and that was around the draft and, you know, getting lucky, getting like a guy like Giannis as the 15th pick with people not necessarily knowing he was going to end up being maybe the best player in the NBA. Um, it can, it can happen. They it, have and both then, Lopez it, even, brothers. I mean, come on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Robin Lopez. That's going to win the championship. Now? Like, what's going on? Yeah. Did you see that? I, I just saw the little thing the other night of, uh, when Brooke Lopez's three bounced in and Robin Lopez, like gave like the shoulder shrug on the bench. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, so that. yeah, it's really oh, fun to have those two guys actually playing together. I, I, twins playing together. Is, is, it's fun. It's amazing. And um, <laughs> yeah. So, but like you saw with Milwaukee, even like a team like Denver, like, you know, they, they did a great job building through the draft and they got some nice pieces and now they're kind of in the mix of things too. And, and Utah, so, um, yeah, it, it's, I know that the super teams are still who we want to talk about. And like, 
you know, the guys, the teams that have like top five to 10 players in the league. But, um, yeah, like th- there's some teams that just drafted these guys and now they're in the mix uh, as well. Yeah. And that's, I mean, look at the Raptors had one clear cut, absolute grade a superstar. If the bucks happen to win this year, they're going to have one clear cut, clear cut, absolute yeah. superstar. Like, so you're right. Maybe so yeah. I will say that the Raptors had a, a couple guys who you didn't know were like all-stars who were fantastic. That's true. And, uh, and even the Bucks, like you know, have have some like excellent uh, role players. So yeah, yeah it, it's about team construction, and and that I think the Warriors miss Kevin Durant. Obviously, they miss Clay Thompson, but they miss Andre Iguodala, and um, they miss Sean Livingston as well. So like, it, it was all of those role guys that really made them such a great team. Yeah, it's true. Team construction is huge. And and with that, I do want to talk about the Western Conference for a second. I know all of this is like super early returns. I get that. But, you know, I have content to put out. So, you know, I got to talk about it. Um, I want to talk about the Warriors really quick because it's not just that they've lost both of their games is that they've lost both of their games in terrifying fashion. So they have a league worst negative 20. No second to league worst to the Kings. I'm sorry, but their point differential is negative 23.5. I know it's only two games, but they, and I know they don't have any healthy centers, but they just, they look discombobulated. There was some chatter on Blazers Twitter today And to be fair, it was couched with this is a pipe dream. But there was some chatter about, hey, you know, like if if Draymond is only going to be maximized in a system where he has shooters in a legit center. I know a team that has something like that, the Portland Trailblazers. And then like, oh, like would the Warriors be willing to part with Draymond Green? Like, and I get they have a new arena. Like they need people to go to the games. Like I understand that. So we'll just, I just wanted to throw that out there and leave it aside. But what I wanted to ask was, the Warriors, they're waiting for Clay Thompson to come back. So, but but meanwhile, Steph Curry is 31, 32. Uh, Draymond is not getting any younger. Um, this Warriors team that is so used to winning, it's been this insanely dynastic franchise of a brand new arena, blah, 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 blah. Can they afford to punt an entire year? I mean, can they afford to spend an entire year of Steph Curry's prime kind of waiting for Clay Thompson to get back? Or do you think they're going to make a move maybe? I mean, at the trade deadline or past December and they can trade D'Angelo Russell. Is that something they could do? I'm just curious because they've been so good for so long. It just seems, And if they're just waiting for some dude to get back, it just seems like, are they really going to wait until next year? Like, I don't know. Like, do you have any thoughts about that? It's just something I'm curious about. Yeah, I, I think that it, it was kind of like, did people really expect the Warriors to compete for the championship this year? Like, no, but without, I don't think they expected them to look this bad this early. Yeah, well, I, I think it's way too early to completely write them off. Like, you know, they're playing pretty well tonight against the Pelicans, albeit the defeated Pelicans <laughs> rather than undefeated. But, um, yeah, they, uh, I, I think it's, you know, it, like, like they were saying the same thing about LeBron last year. And then they go out and get Anthony Davis and it looks like they're at least going to be like, okay. And, uh, I feel like the Warriors will probably be the same way. And then you have like that trade chip with the uh, D'Lo. So, um, yeah, I, I think they'll eventually like, they're going to kind of find themselves. And, uh, I want you to talk shit yeah, about well, the Warriors. Dude, Come on, man. I, I, I don't know. I, I have a hard <laughs> time doing that. I have no, a hard fair. time doing that. Even though I was, I would, like actively root against the Warriors, but um, <laughs> yeah, I have uh, their fans. a hard time, like just completely like writing off a player like Steph Curry and, and Draymond Green, even if this should make people maybe like evaluate where exactly they would put them if the, these struggles continue. Yeah, that I think I think that that's a fair take. Uh, let's let's talk about the rookies, and then let's let's get a couple Blazers questions in. Get you out. Um, I'm sad that we can't talk about rookies in the context of the Blazers, the Blazers are not going to have any rookies that crack this list, which is uh, scoring. And I know that there are lots of other ways to measure the uh, efficiency and measure the effectiveness of players and just their scoring. But just for the sake of keeping it simple, I wanted to tick down the list 
of the top five scoring rookies so far this year and just wanted to get your reaction of like which of these players surprises you most to be on that list so we have uh the top scoring rookie is kendrick nunn at 22.3 points a game uh, number two is rj barrett at 21 points number three is john morant at 18 number four is kobe white at 16.7 and number five is rui hachimura at 16.3 of those five names, none, Barrett, Morant, White, and Hachimura, which of those rookies surprises you the most to be on that top five scoring list? Well, Kendrick Nunn. <laughs> <laughs> Kendrick, Kendrick Nunn, uh, I saw he had that 40-point game at the end of the preseason. Um, the fact that you know everybody was talking about uh, Tyler Hero, and um, they're starting together right now, and Kendrick Nunn right now is uh, leading rookies in scoring, like, but even with him, so he um, played a year or he was at uh, University of Oakland, uh, started at University of Illinois, um, but transferred. And uh, he was the second leading scorer to um, Trey Young in the NCAA. So we knew he could like put the ball in the bucket and he had a good year. He could shoot. Um yeah, it's just, it's still surprising. He, he didn't play in the NBA last year. I think there were maybe some off court issues that were uh, involved with that and, and might've been some injuries possibly, but um, he, yeah, he certainly seems like he's garnered a role on Miami so far. And uh, it will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, yeah. Like this guy is putting up buckets. Uh, the other two guys uh, who follow him, RJ and Ja, were the second and third pick in the draft, so you kind of expected them. Kobe White has been doing really well. He was the seventh pick in the draft. Um, but, yeah, I, I wasn't sure he was going to get as much uh, playing time as he has, even though I was very high on him going into the draft as well. And then um, Rui Hachimura was a guy you knew was going to play a lot. He was ninth pick. Um there was a huge separation between like draft Twitter people uh, who didn't think he had a great feel for the game. And then scouts who loved the intangibles and, you know, the shooting and the body and the athleticism. So um, yeah, I, I, I knew he was going to play quite a bit. The guy right after him is uh, PJ Washington. And I, I think he has come out of the gates like on fire. Um, he had, I think, five three pointers in like the first half of his first NBA game and scored 27 points. Um, so yeah, like those two guys look like legit, you know, role players for their teams right now. Uh, albeit two of the worst teams in the NBA. Yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> those teams are usually the ones where the rookies get the most play and get to show the most, right? They get the for most sure. counting stats. Um, if you mm -hmm. were to guess, and I, all of this is way too early, but okay, fine. I'm going to qualify it every time. With Zion Williamson being out, let's just assume, and this is crappy to assume, but let's assume that Zion doesn't end up playing enough games to qualify. From what you've seen so far, what you saw of them in college, who do you think is the favorite to win Rookie of the Year if you're taking Zion out of the equation? I think it might be Jaw. And uh, that was just based on like a, a few games so far. Um, I, I, I'm a big RJ Barrett guy as well. And I, I feel like he can put it together. I just think the Knicks are kind of a mess. I think then that Memphis might win more games. Um, and uh, yeah, jaws going to have the ball in his hands a lot. Um, great passer. He's shown that he can, you know, make some really athletic finishes as well. So yeah, if I, I would say jaw after Zion, I'm still not, I'm, I'm holding out that Zion I feel like if Zion plays like half a season, then he might even do enough to win rookie of the year. Like he's like in retrospect, Joel Embiid played 31 games his rookie year. The team had won 10 games the year before they won 13 with him in those 31 games. Like he made a huge impact and was by far like the best player when he was playing Malcolm Brogdon ended up winning because he played in every game and the bucks ended up having like a decent year. But, um, yeah, I, I feel like, uh, I would put the over under Zion win the rookie, like as far as games go, I could see him playing like 41 games and him still winning rookie of the year. 
Well, and part of that calculus for people who are voting on that stuff is they have to measure the total value a player had during the season versus the yeah. impact they had when they played. And I, I think that voters yeah. are yeah, getting, yeah, yeah I, voters are getting more and more savvy about how is this going to look if you project it forward? Like if we don't pick Zion, like if he plays 47 games and he's really good in those 47 and then he ends up having an yeah. amazing career, we don't pick him for rookie of the year. How's that going to look? The history books are not going to smile on that. So yeah, I, I feel you on that. Uh, Let's talk about the Blazers. I know that you did watch the first game, the Blazers between uh, uh, when they played Sacramento Kings. Sorry, it's getting late in the day. I already worked. My brain is fried. Um, and oh, there, was some, there, good. <laughs> there were some things in that game that showed up that are continuing to show up in the games they played since, and, and particularly their defense, and particularly, particularly their three-point defense. So as we stand now, if you're not counting this game against the Spurs, which as of recording, it's at halftime, and the Blazers have a slight lead, the Blazers are... 29th in uh, three pointers allowed, and I believe 26th in three point percentage allowed. Uh, that means they're giving up a lot of threes, and the threes they give up are going in. That's not good. I mean, they lost Harkless, they lost Aminu, and I understand there's going to be some deficiencies on defense there. But from what you saw in that Kings game, do you think that some of the problems that the Blazers have on defense, do you think that some of them are fixable with fit and, and cohesion and scheme, or do you think it's just a, a lack of talent that there's just something there or rather something not there that is leading to this, this woeful defensive outcome? I, I feel like it's been something they struggled with, like as far as just with guards in general, um, yeah, like Dame and CJ are guys who are, if they're not hitting their shots, then the Blazers could be in trouble. Um, Harkless and Aminu helped in a big way as far as that went. And I'm not sure that they replaced them necessarily with the defensive equivalent. Plus, you know, you get teams like uh, Denver and like, th that's an a area where Hassan Whiteside may like kind of struggle. Um, and like, even like Zach, like as great as Zach has been defensively, like in, if you get him on the perimeter, it's not necessarily like his best case scenario. Um, so I do think it's fixable and I, I, I'm guessing they'll focus on that more as uh, the season goes on, but yeah, it's definitely something to monitor, um, with the Blazers and, uh, it could be a huge issue because yeah, we see that teams are like flamethrowing against them right now. And with that, do you like, I mean, as someone who follows the NBA and is a fan of the Blazers, at least, um, uh, Pro, I mean, I, I would qualify you as way more of a professional than me. So I'm just going to say that you're a professional. Um, do you think that, and this, and this is something that I I've asked, I think all of my guests so far, do you think that there's something about, whatever culture or leadership that coach Stotts and Dame brings that will allow this team, which turned over 70% of its minutes in the starting positions, either by losing them or they're injured in Nurkic and all like a bunch of really important role players. They lost so many people. Do you think that there's something about the leadership and cohesion qualities of Stotts and Dame that will allow this Blazers team to come together more quickly than they otherwise would? Or is that whole kind of leadership culture thing, just sort of something Blazers fans that tell themselves to feel better at night, basically. Is that a real thing? Um, it could be. <laughs> I want a definitive not, answer, sir. Back yeah, by science. Good. I, I would say like science has shown that uh, coach Stotts and Dame usually have the Blazers on the right path. And um, I feel like a lot of people are questioning this team. Like a lot of people really question the offseason moves and including me. Uh, things to be fair. Yeah. 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 The name of the podcast uh, is I like the Blazers. And I'm questioning it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, and for good reason, like, you know, you, they gave up some valuable pieces and, and missing Nurk, like even hit them in the playoffs a little bit. Um, he would have been a likely like uh, really helped against a team like uh, Golden State, even though like you know Golden State going small and everything like that. But yeah, like Nurk certainly would have helped there. And um, 
Hark- we see like Harkless playing a nice role with the Clippers right now. And um, we're still not completely sure like what our wing situation is going to be like as the season progresses. Like Rodney, gay Rodney back is nice, but you know, is Rodney going to be like that third guy you rely on as a scorer or, you know, is he, is he going to play like he did against uh, Denver or is he going to play like he did against Oklahoma City? I think they're hoping that he's going to be a contributor, right? I mean, they're going to need double digits from him like every night. But like what, what level that, that, they're hoping a higher level. And um, yeah, like, you know, I'm totally in on Anthony Simons, by the way. Uh, but like, yeah, like, you know, a guy like Kent Bazemore, like what level is he going to bring? Like who, who's going to kind of be that guy who becomes the, either the wing defender or the, you know, guy you kind of rely on if Dame and CJ might be off on a given night. Um, so yeah, they're, they're still looking for that, but I feel like with coach Stotts and with Damien and with CJ, they have something to build on. And and that's like a reason why I think you can be like, say, okay, you know, the Hassan Whiteside thing at least is workable because of his relationship with those guys. And, uh, that's why you could see the Blazers. I, I feel still being a playoff team. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And I mean, I get that expectations are pretty high. They made the Western Conference Finals. And so there's a lot of talk about when you look at ourselves as a championship team, I think you have to tell yourself that if you're the team as someone who's watching the team, that's a a larger pill to swallow if that's a saying. But no, I'm with you. I I think that you can absorb a little bit of that because of what Damon Stotts brings. Um, All right, man, with that, I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Michael Weisenberg, if people wanted to connect with you or check out your work, how would they do that? Uh, NBA Draft Mikey V on Twitter. And um, I'm doing stuff with uh, Rookie Wire right now uh, from USA Today. So yeah, if you go to Rookie Wire, uh, type it into Google, it should come up. Nice, man. I appreciate you. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. Thank you again to Michael Weisenberg of Rookie Wire. It's always a lot of fun to have him on the show. And we were talking after recording ended about how I was trying to get him to make like a hot take and he's just not going to do it. He's a reasonable and measured dude and a smart dude. He just doesn't want to do the hot take business. Damn it. Really wanted to catch him with one of those. Uh, Didn't work out this time. Uh, Follow his work at Ricky Wire. Then with that, I think that's about it. Again, as I said in the first part, the Blazers are playing the Thunder tomorrow, Wednesday, October 30. Hoping if they win that game, which they should, they'll be 3-1 on this road trip, which would be great. And we're definitely back with another episode of I Like the Blazers as soon as we can do it. And if you want to follow us, please do at I Like the Blazers on Twitter. We're also on Facebook. You can send us an email at I Like the Blazers at gmail.com. But what I would really, really appreciate if you're able to do it, please, on any podcatcher that you're using, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Google Play or CastBox or Spotify or Stitcher, we should be on all those. I would love for you to please subscribe and please give a review. The reviews matter a lot, more than you'll understand. I don't know why some executive at Apple thought that pushing your finger to a star means that your podcast deserves more visibility and should show up more in searches and I, I i mean i do know why because there's, how else are you going to do it i get that but it really really matters so if you enjoy the show if you dig what we're doing if you like the guests then please give us a five-star review it would be highly highly appreciated and that's about it for i like the blazers i am your host brandon goldner until next time thank you so much and uh, yeah go blazers